I'm back, bitches. It's Monday, May motherfucking 5th. The first Monday of May. We'll all start from motherfucking zero. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Pro Flowers. Don't forget to thank the real pros this Mother's Day. Listen, my wife is tremendous. Mother's Day, we go all out of the fucking Casa, and Pro Flowers will be on the list. It's coming up May 12th. Don't forget, where would you be without your mother? Where would you be? Not here. Nowhere. You understand me? Pro Flowers lets you choose from a variety of bouquets and vases that suit every mom's style. All you got to do is pick the delivery date. Right now, you got a dozen assorted roses for $19.99. You hear me? Double the roses and get a premium vase for just $9.99 more. That's what I'm talking about. Visit proflowers.com. Click the microphone on the upper right corner and enter promo code. Write this down. Happening. H-A-P-P-E-N-I-N-G. That's proflowers.com. Click the microphone. Use code HAPPENING. Mother's Day is May 12th, so don't wait. Order like a pro and get an amazing rose deal to thank all the moms in your life. This is tremendous. Because if you like your mom, you can send her these flowers and show up. And if you don't like your mom, you can send her these and then give her a call and tell the kid's sick. You ain't going close to that bitch. Her third husband, she married Hector. You know what I'm saying? That's what you need to hook up with Hector on Sunday on Mother's Day. You know things are going to happen. And the church is also brought to you by cbdlion.com listen no more buying cbd products in the bodega made by some witch doctor in the basement cbd lion is the way to go they make cbd products from start to finish cbd lion has you covered and right now the church family gets 20 percent off not even 10 20 go to cbdlion.com and check out their third party lab results yourself Church family gets 20% off when you can write in church. Type it in, C-H-U-R-C-H, at checkout. Who's better than you? Lee, kick this motherfucking mule. Great to fucking be back. I'm only home for a week and a half, and I go back to finish shooting a couple days in New York City. For starters, it was a great experience. It's great to be back. I missed you motherfuckers on a pro tip. Uh, you know, it was the weirdest thing because when I got this movie, and the movie I got, guys, I can tell you, I can't tell you who's in the movie, none of that shit, but I can tell you because you're going to find out anyway. It's out. I guess there was paparazzi taking pictures, and one of my pictures came out, so people are bothering me. I'm in the Sopranos <laughs> prequel, uh, the Sopranos from 67, The Many Saints of Newark. It's. Uh, I was very fortunate to get it, and when I got it, I was happy, but then I started thinking about it that I had to be there for three fucking weeks. Plus, I got another movie that I'm going to shoot in June. Thank God it's not at the same time. I thought I had to shoot them both at the same time. But when I got the movie, right away, I was happy for a few days. And then I did what every fucking moron did. I started thinking about it. <laughs> and the more I thought about it, I didn't think I could survive 19 days without my wife and kid. What am I going to do? You know, uh, just a bunch of negative shit comes into your mind when something good happens. And it happens at every fucking level, as you notice. I mean, uh, just negative shit came in. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to do well. And thank God for Tom Pop and another one of my friends that I talked that talked me into it. I agreed to do it, and now I'm very happy because it's uh, it was a life-changing experience that I needed right now. I've been getting flat. You ever get flat in your fucking life? Like, you're just flat. You go to work. You, you do what you got to do when you go home. You go to work. You kind of become a machine, and you look for something. But you don't know what it is. You know, when you stop wasting time, now you have all this fucking time to do what you really want to do with your life. And sometimes... You become flat. Yeah, you do a little writing, you do this, you do that, but there's 24 hours in a fucking day. You can't ride all day, and you can't do jumping jacks all day, and you can't sit around with your fucking friends all day. You got to make forward progress, which is what I'm always doing, but at the same time, I got to be honest with you, I got a little fucking bored. Like, I just got bored. And this movie came up, and uh, right away, the fears come in. Oh, yeah. And again, I... I when I got on the plane, I was fine. When I landed in New York, you know, I had my anxiety, my little panic fucking shit. I got to the hotel room, and I started doubting myself, blah, 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 blah. But the first night, I had to go to wardrobe. And once I went to wardrobe and I figured out exactly what I was doing, I was fine. Then I walked out of wardrobe. I had a hot dog right down 42nd Street. And then about an hour later, when I got to the hotel, about a block from the hotel, I saw a fucking rat. And I knew I was home. Like, once I saw the <laughs> fucking rat, that was the sign that I'm in the gutter of life. I'm back here where it all started. So I had a few days 
to go before I shot. I had like, I got there Monday and I think I had to shoot Wednesday and Friday the first week, Wednesday and Thursday, because that Friday I went to Minneapolis. Thank you for coming to the shows with Dean Delray. And then that Saturday was 420 with Milwaukee. You guys are great. Two sold out shows. Thank you very much. The city of Milwaukee was a great 420. Somebody fucking Cosby me with a fucking edible in Milwaukee. I still don't know who it is. And guess what? I don't give a fuck. He did a good job. I got fucked up. But I came uh, the first week. I was just, I was just frozen. I didn't know how to act. So that Tuesday, before I did anything, I took a fucking Uber up to 88th Street where I grew up when I came, you know. And it was just overwhelming to see the block where so much had happened. I mean, this when I moved into this apartment building, I was three quarters retarded. And after I got hit with the head with the lunchbox and I started to experience New York City and what it was about and I grew into my skin, I, I became like a little man there. Like I thought about all the things my mom would make me do. Like I remember with a I walked up and stood in front of the building and I was gonna take a picture and all that shit. But guess what? I when I've took this trip, I took it with the thing that I didn't want to do podcasts. I didn't want to do a lot of stand-up comedy. I didn't want to book anything significant like Nyack or A Night in New York. I just wanted to work out. So I did spots in Danger Fields, real light, 10, 12 people a night, just up there riffing, fucking around, just to keep the timing alive. And that that was it. I didn't want to do people's podcasts. I didn't want to be running around. I just wanted to focus on this movie. I was going to have a lot on my fucking plate. I don't think my agents, that's how I told my agents, don't even talk to me about dates. I don't want to know nothing. All I want to do is focus on that fucking movie. I got a great opportunity. I got to put 100% into it. And I went up to my old neighborhood and I walked around. Then I went to the public school, 166. I crossed the street to the horse place. I never rode a horse there. I was always scared, but I would go in there and steal horseshoes. What? And sell them to other kids and shit for like a dollar, 50 cents, whatever the fuck it was in those days, a quarter. Is this the neighborhood of Mr. Martini? Yeah, this okay. is Mr. Martini's neighborhood. I saw Mr. Martini's house. <laughs> it's worth like a half a fucking billion dollars now. It's a redstone. There's probably four kids buried in the backyard in the fucking <laughs> place. Uh, but it was just so weird what I got from standing in front of that building. Like I remembered my mom would put a huge gold chain on me and make me go out to see if I would protect myself if somebody tried to rob it. Like, there was so many lessons that came to me while I'm standing in front of that fucking building. And I just walked around. That was it. I went up to all the way up to, like, 93rd Street. And then I walked down to, like, 79th Street to, like, stand up New York. I looked around there. I saw the Kari Dad, But I didn't want to eat Chinese food because it's got a lot of sodium and you blow up. And you don't want to be on camera fucking bloated up looking like fucking Johnny Cheech. <laughs> so I said, fuck it. I only ate Chinese food on Easter Sunday. I went to Chan's and I finished up. The first week in New York was rough on the fucking diet. I only worked out one time. And I want to thank Inline Fitness for helping me work out, Adam and my man Jonathan. And I also went to King's Thai Boxing down on 30 fucking 6th Street with my man Jay, the Dominican, and my girl Carmen, the Puerto Rican from the fucking Bronx. They hooked the brother up. I went there a few times to keep in shape and to sweat out all the fucking sodium from the New York food. And once I went up to that fucking neighborhood and walked around, that's why I felt my balls. Like, I was like, okay, this is who the fuck I am again. This is where I came from. And then that night, you know me, I had hit Rudy's in Cliffside Park the first night. So I jumped on the motherfucking ferry from uh, the New York waterworks there and took it into fucking Edgewater, Weehawken. And then my buddy picked me up and went to Rudy's and we hung out. And I told him to take a ride around that fucking neighborhood just to see what that was like anymore. I didn't go down to my mother's house or around that area. I just stayed up lightly in North Bergen. And I went home early that night. And, you know, the first night when you're out of California, you're not going to sleep. You're not going to sleep because of the time change. And so I knew that going in. That would give me a night just to get uh, accustomed to, you know, filming. And... I went on the fucking set Wednesday, and it was uh, it was a rough day for me because I hadn't acted in a movie. You know, movie and TV is different. I hadn't acted in a movie in a long time. So the first day was type of, kind of uh, rough for me. I didn't know what was going on, really. But one of the actors, I was watching him 
and he's fucking phenomenal, and I just fed off his energy in a way. And then I got into it, and by the second day, I was all the fuck away. And, you know, I had tapped into David Chase's mind. I mean, here's a guy that put a television show on that was the blueprint for Breaking Bad, you know, Sons of Anarchy, King of Thrones, whatever the fuck, Game of Thrones. So he had something to bring to the table. It's really weird when you work somebody of a high caliber, you you open your eyes. Like, I didn't watch my dailies, but I watched... For two minutes, I watched what the cameras looked like and shit. And that's when it all came to me. Of what the fuck? I was involved in. Like, I had to go sit down. My blood pressure had gone up. Like, I'm involved in something fucking big. And I'm telling you guys, I don't want it on social media. I'm telling you guys because I don't want you guys to read it somewhere. I'll see that picture they put up of me at Getty. I don't want, I want you to hear it from me. I can't, that's all I can fill you in on. Uh, I'm happy for you guys because you bet on me and I came through for you. You know what I'm saying? So a year from now, when the movie gets released, you know, you're part of it because uh, we've been doing this podcast. And like I've said since day one, this podcast, you guys are my psychiatry because you keep me in fucking check. You keep me working out. You keep me looking at things. You keep me trying to be sharper. I take 16 months in between dates and cities. So when I go back, it's a new experience for you guys. You know what I'm saying? But. Back to what happened in New York. You know, when I was walking around, it all came back to me, you know, where I had come from. I have a rule, you know, I like to travel for three days, especially when it comes to New York. Because when I'm in New York longer than three days, it takes me a few days to unwind. Like, it takes me a little longer because it takes me back that far back. Like, it takes me into Coco, you know, when I was robbing and doing bad things. So after a few days, I go my mind goes to places it shouldn't fucking go. But in the same thought, here I am on a movie set. And I thought about the stretch I had made. And I thought about the things I had done along the way to get, like I was back there in 93 grinding it out, guys. I was a fucking open micer wishing I could get an audition. You know, and I took a comedy class and I fucking worked at the old New York comedy club and, was I doing it right or what? It doesn't matter. I was in the struggle. I was there. I still remember paying, you know, $40 to park to audition for an improv troupe at the Copacabana that I had knew nothing about. I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. When I walked in there, I still think today that those people remember who I am. And they're <laughs> laughing at me behind my back because I went in there and I didn't belong there. But that's not the here and now. What was weird is that I saw my struggle back there as something meaningful. It wasn't a waste. Those nine months I put into New York weren't a waste because here I was 20-something years later in a major film. And that's a great fucking feeling. So even though I was thinking about robbing the hammer call across the street from the high school and you know, when I went down side streets, I thought about the people I robbed on that block or the time I crawled into this window or whatever. I looked at the bar where I used to borrow money from the loan shark and never pay him back and... You know, I looked at all these things, and it just reflected of where the move I had made in my life and how proud I should be. But I don't, I'm not. I'm not because I was such a piece of shit that I'm just trying to get back now to just being normal. Like, I just want to be a regular fucking guy. I don't want to do nothing. I just want to live my life regular. I want to be a good dad and a good husband and go out that way. As long as I go out that way, I'm very fucking happy. But a lot of things came to focus for me in New York. Like, even being a fucking immigrant, you know, like, for years we've been living here and you never heard the word immigrant. All of a sudden, the last three years, you know, we focus on immigrants and what the fuck's going on. I must have taken 90 fucking Ubers in New York the last 10, 19 days. Nine, three, you got to figure four Ubers a day. I took so many Ubers, I made platinum level. Damn. That's how many fucking Ubers I took in New York. But I tell you what, that was probably the best part of my trip were the Ubers because I got to ride. You know how many white Uber drivers picked me up? Three? Zero. The whole time? The whole time. Damn. The whole time. It was fucking third world nations, a couple Hindus, and fucking <laughs> Spanish people, a couple Chinese people. The most inspiring was a girl that picked me up in the heart of Brooklyn at two in the fucking morning. A Hindu girl. She had been in this country for one year. You ready for this? One year. 
And she was, she spoke like she had been here for 10 fucking years. She said it was important to her to learn English so she'd get the most out of her stay here so she could become an American. That fucking cracked me. Like, that cracked me. She said she was working at an Indian restaurant. She was getting eight bucks an hour, and she got sick and tired of having a boss. So she does Uber from 12 to 9, six nights a week, and she tripled her fucking income. And she says she works nights because there's no traffic. It's better for her. A fucking woman telling me this shit. I'm like, I know guys who are scared to drive Uber at fucking night. Here's this little 110-pound little Indian girl. You know, I was so fucking blown away from her. I got picked up by fucking Arabs. I, th that was so interesting to speak to about why they were Ubering. Like, it's people who one day said, fuck it. If I'm going to get fucked in the ass, I'm going to control my own destiny. And they make a schedule, and they stick to it. And, I mean, this guy was, you know, these guys were telling me a little. Every time I get in, I'd ask them how long they've been driving, why they're driving, and how they liked it. Not one of them said they hated it. They picked their own hours. They were their own bosses. I mean, I remember the fucking day I, I realized you could do that. I was probably... <clears throat> it was before I got locked up. I had this boss named David Wayne Means that used to always say, I never want to live in a world where I have to have a ceiling over my income. Like, I don't want to be stuck at a certain fucking income. I want every week to be an adventure. Yeah, there's 52 weeks. You're not going to make $6,000 every fucking week. But even if you make 800, it's better than having your own boss. I looked at all these people that were immigrants that figured out the real fucking American way and I thought about all the fucking stiffs I'm around out here. To the fucking bumpies that, that are waiting for a fucking handout or they just, you know, and it inspired me. It inspired me. The other day I was talking to Deborah fucking Hupster. She's fucking Ubering. That bitch don't stop. You know, you can't stop Deborah fucking Hupster. You got to shoot her with a fucking bazooka. <laughs> You're not going to stop her, you know. So these are the people that keep me fucking going. When I spoke to all... And look, I goof around and all this shit. But hey, man, the truth is the fucking truth. These people bloomed. That was the best part of being in New York with you, but the whole 19 days. The people that I spoke to, Chinese. I spoke to this old Chinese guy that was a fucking engineer. And he retired, but he fucking wanted to. Do you take work. any cabs? Not one. Not one cab, wow. Not one cab. I Ubered fucking everywhere. I just thought it was easier. It was no drama. And I figured out that, believe it or not, you save money with Uber. You save a lot of fucking money with Uber, man. I was seeing what I was spending on cars and shit. It's ridiculous. It is fucking ridiculous. You know, I have a friend that has a car service, and I would call him up. Listen, when I to go to the airport, I could get there myself. When you after you take a six hour flight, you really don't want no fucking stories. Right. After I'm on a six hour fucking flight. I don't want to walk the terminal fucking six upstairs with three bags of fucking luggage when my legs are all dead and Ubering for the Uber to say 20 minutes. And then you're out there. I'm in terminal E. You're in ter Where are you? F. I put it down in the fucking thing. And you said, okay. <laughs> I put down F. Terminal F. And you said, okay. And now you're calling me from fucking E. Take a run. Take a run. I did it to the guy at LAX the other night. Take a fucking lap around. I don't give a fuck at this point. I'm not carrying three fucking bags, one that weighs fucking a thousand pounds, the terminal fucking eat, you know. But besides that, I had no complaints. I love Uber. I fucking love them. I know that at the end of the week, I saw when I took a cab from LAX to my house, I saw what I was spending. Yeah. And I saw that they had become a little bit of these scumbags. Like the one day I wasn't paying attention, and the guy took me home on the 105. Next thing you know, I was downtown LA. Why am I downtown L.A.? <laughs> You're that time. Because there's traffic. No, there's not. It's 9.15 in the fucking morning. You, your tip is done. Like, I had to tell him, your tip is gone. I hope you enjoy the fucking $8 you tried to rob from me. Because I usually throw you a fucking 20 spot. Now you get nothing for being a fucking dirty sneak. You know, you got... Now, I learned all about Uber and the surcharges. You can't fuck around with Uber in certain times in New York. They will rape you. Oh, yeah. They will fucking shove it up your ass and well-deserved. Listen, it's uh, it's economics. It's shortage of whatever. It rains in New York. That surcharge goes up 40 bucks. 
Oh, yeah. There was a couple nights I landed at the fucking ferry, and I would go to Dangerfields, and they would say, 50 bucks at 840. So I would sit there and make phone calls till 905, and it would go down to $31 after nine. You know, oh, yeah, whenever it's busy, they... Yeah, they just raise... But it's, at least, like, with them, with them, I always feel like it's... That at least they're up front. That's the thing that's, that gets on my nerves, too. It's when, it's when you feel like people are trying to get something over on you. Well, that's what happened the last time I took a cab. And I always supported cabs because I've been taking them for years. But after I got robbed this last time, I said, fuck it. And I looked at what I paid. You know, like there's Uber X and there's Uber XL. When I have luggage, I got Uber XL. If I got to go from 3rd Avenue to 8th Avenue and 20 blocks, it's Uber X. I don't need no fucking, you know. I'm not going to take a train. I took one fucking train to Brooklyn. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> Why? I, I thought I was going to have a heart attack, guys. I, I, I just, listen. You don't like being underground? No. I don't have any problem with that shit. I'm from the underground. You know what I'm saying? I'm from the original underground. I, I took more trains than Johnny fucking trains. But you're not used to it no more. The train, every time I get on this train, you feel for your life. <laughs> For those fucking 18 minutes on that train ride to Brooklyn, I actually feared for my life, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to lie to you. I actually felt around in my pocket. I had no keys. I could stab somebody with a hotel key. <laughs> for the first time, I didn't have fucking a key in my pocket. I'm like, how am I going to fight one of these attackers? I got no mace. All I got is a right kick to the stomach. And if that don't work, I'm done. I'll have a heart attack from anxiety if somebody anxi attacks me. I And I went up there at 1130 in the morning, and I felt unsafe. First of all, nobody will give you directions. Right, like yeah. New Yorkers just will not give you directions. That little information box, they've lowered the volume. Oh, no. To fuck with you. Like, uh, excuse me, I got to get off on 65th Street in Brooklyn. The guy talked like he had a fucking uh, something up his ass. <laughs> and he was like whispering to me like it was a mob, like I was in the fucking mafia or something like this. I go, can you speak up first now? I was petrified. So before, I, did, I you ever take information from somebody you don't trust them? Yeah. You know how many times I gave out fake information in my life? People come up to me, where's Canipsey Street? And I'd send them to fucking Delaware. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> these people in these boxes, I did not trust for one minute. They were looking me up and down, like, and they would, I felt that they were sending me on a train so I'd get robbed or something. So the, I only took a train <laughs> one day. I got a call from, from the movie people, and they go, listen, it's an easy train ride. And I go, you know what? What's a fucking train ride to Uncle Joey, right? It was like a six-block walk. <laughs> I didn't mind that. That I didn't mind. But once I went downstairs, it's a complete different fucking world. You ever see the original Planet of the Apes? There's a movie called Beneath the Planet of the Apes that came out in 1971 or 72. They, go, they all lived under the trains. There was something to do under the fucking trains where the people ripped their skins off their faces. Oh, my God. And they were Martians or they were fucking whatever. And that, it was them against the apes. Let me tell you something. I felt like one of these people were about to rip their face <laughs> off when I. They were the fucking weirdest looking people in the world. People looking for money. Some guy thrown on the fucking floor. You could smell piss. By the time you're there, you see a thousand fucking rats on the train track, and you think there's something wrong with your out. eyes. You're looking at a post, and you could see things moving. <laughs> like it's like, did I do a fucking edible at ten thirty in the morning? No, I didn't. And then you realize, shit, that's right. Those are rats down there. Let me stay a little bit away from the fucking thing. Jesus. So I get on the fucking train, and right away on the train, there's a guy, excuse me. <laughs> you know, I got AIDS. I got a, an ingrown toenail. I got back <laughs> acne. You know, there was another guy playing a fucking organ. It was, I feared from everybody on the train looked angry. I could hear some guy coughing with bronchitis. I could feel the bronchitis creeping in on my thing. I had to get off, walk a little bit, and then get on another train. And what I did was I called a friend of mine that was in his office, and I made him look up. You know, he takes trains, but he takes other different type of trains, like in Manhattan. And I called him up, and he carved it out for me, and thank God I got to the location. When I walked above and I saw Brooklyn, I said, I'm never taking a train again. Like, my daughter wants to go on a train. I don't know no more. Like, I don't know. That was just fucking crazy on that fucking train. And L.A. ain't no better. They stabbed somebody yesterday at the Echo Park station. Did they really? Yeah, it was on the news. Somebody was saying it yesterday. When I came back, I went over the subconscious because it was Saturday. I came. I had to go to swim class with the baby, and I figured they had to take a shower and shit, so I figured, let me take a fucking drive and see what's cracking in the neighborhood. So I went by subconscious, and I was telling them. I got on a, I got on a train for the adventure, and it was the adventure of death. Like, I was fucking <laughs> scared when I got off. And I don't have to lie to you people. You know I tell you how the fuck it is. 
When I came above that ground, I was like, woof. I fucking made it without getting raped. I mean, because that's what I felt like. Like, I, like they were going to surround me and fucking rape me on that fucking train. But Jesus. that was it for the fucking trains. Beside that, I got the full fucking experience, man. I took the ferry. I got to smell the Hudson River. It still smells horrible. How are the hot dogs? I only had one. That's it? One. That okay. was it. I had one on wardrobe day. I stopped some fucking Arab. I said, Sam, right. <laughs> he looked at me like I called him a fucking Islam. <laughs> He put the fucking sabron on with the onions. I ate it, but I said, something's not right. And he was a nice guy. We talked for a little while and everything. It's just not the, it's not the same. I had it. The first week I was there, I didn't, I can't tell you I went off my diet. But, you know, when I went to the the first day on the set and all that stuff, the set had tremendous food. But I didn't eat salami the whole time I was there. No cold cuts. Nice. If I would eat a slice of pizza, I'd eat it with a fucking salad. I kept, I drank nothing but water. I didn't even drink fucking diet soda. The only thing I drank that was that had sugar in it was kombucha. That was it, just to clean my system out, because you got that Hudson River water going into you every day, cleaning you out. I stuck to it, guys. I fucking stuck to my Weight Watcher points. I, like I said, I went to Inform Fitness on 51st Street. Across the street, there was Giuseppe's or something's Pizza, Cusamato's Pizza. I would lift and I would go across the street, get a slice with a salad, and then I would make myself walk 12 or 15 fucking blocks. And then I, I saw how I felt and I'd take an Uber the rest of the way or I would just walk home to whatever hotel I was staying at. I, stayed, I stayed at three different fucking hotels in three weeks. Did you really? The first week I stayed at the Williams Hotel, which was great, on 39th and fucking 3rd. It was a great hotel, clean, fucking coffee and shit like that. It was an English-themed hotel. And they didn't have breakfast in the building. Oh. And you had to walk two blocks to get fucking breakfast. And, you know, yeah, you can make coffee in the room. And I would get up and write, do my early writing. I had a vapor pen, which guess what, guys? I'm done with vapor pens. Really? Yeah, they don't do nothing to me. My, it's, it's in the morning for two or three days. After that, I could sit there like Pocahontas, <laughs> smoking a peace pipe, and nothing fucking happens to me. So I'm really done with vapor pens. I brought an ounce and a half of fucking weed. I brought an ounce of this cake something that was 27 percent and i i wanted to space out the weed so i only smoked two joints a day i smoked a bat in the morning before i got in the van to shoot and i smoked a bat right on the fucking set before i got back in the van and i would get fucking wasted how much did you bring back not i I, the last joint i smoked the last joint before i got in the fucking uber to the airport oh shit it worked out perfectly I spread it out. I'm a fuck. Come on, dog. I've been smoking like for Jew. 30 fucking years. I had it to the T. And people gave me weed. Like uh, when I went to the theater in Minneapolis, in Milwaukee, the guy had gave me an eighth of weed he bought in Colorado. I gave that to my friend George. And then my other buddy gave me a bag of weed that his friend had grown. I gave that away. I only smoked the weed I brought with me. Nice. I didn't want to smoke anything else. And it lasted me. I smoked the last bazooka. No, don't, don't get me wrong. I rolled some big fucking joints. Yeah. I rolled some fucking nut fingers, so <laughs> don't get me wrong. I smoked an ounce in two weeks. Damn. I got, when I got back from Milwaukee, I cracked into the ounce, and I smoked the same weed for two weeks, and I got to tell you, it was fucking tremendous. I mean, the whole trip was tremendous, guys. It's amazing how scared we get when something's going to be good, how fucking scared we get. All I kept thinking about was when I started comedy, how scared I was. Like, how scared I was to get on fucking stage. And once I did it, it changed everything. And this trip changed everything for me. It changed my outlook on things. Like I said at the beginning, it rejuvenized me. I did the Bo Dito podcast. That was great. I love Carlo and I love Bo. But while I was doing it, I knew I didn't belong there. Like, I was like, I shouldn't be doing any fucking podcasts. I'm going to take a break from podcasts. And that's exactly what I did. I took a break from podcasting for 10 days, 19 days. And uh, it just felt great, guys. And I mean, you're like, Joey, what the fuck? Listen, man, we all need a break from time to time. We don't know it. We don't even know it. We're, we got our heads so far up our fucking asses that we don't even know when it's time to take a break or a breather. And then when it happens, you're like, man, I really fucking needed this. You know, the last thing... I fucking thought I could do was leave my family. I love that little girl with all my fucking heart, guys. 
I didn't want it to fall into a bad situation or something. And I got to tell you, man, it was the best thing for us and our home. You know, it showed a work value on my part. It showed that I'm not scared on my part. You know, I face uh, whatever time with them every day. I spoke to her every day before she went to school. I made it a fucking point to call her before she went to school. The same thing I do and talk to her. And I tell her before we get off, don't let nobody mess with you today. <laughs> and then I talk to her at night. And it was just, uh, it was just great. It was just something different, something new. You know, I got, like I said, I got to go back next week for six days. And I, yes, I am looking forward to it. I get to wrap this fucking great opportunity that I got offered to me by the grace of God. And I got another breather. I got another breather to walk around this time. I'm going to go to my mother's cemetery. I got to go to Union City and walk around a little bit. I'm going to go catch to see that. I didn't even have a Cuban sandwich. Didn't even have a Cuban sandwich. That's how much I watched what I ate because I, I know how you blow up back there. You blow up quick. No sweets whatsoever. One of the nights I took a flan and I ate half of it and I threw the rest of it in the garbage. That was the only sweet I had in 19 fucking days. No sweets at all. I had a chocolate thing on JetBlue Mint like a motherfucker always taking care of Uncle Joey. They have espressos. That's why I fly JetBlue Mint because they give you espresso and they give you a little dark chocolate which is very good for you from time to time. So that's the only sweet, that's the only fucking sugar I ate. This week I'm going to watch it, then I'll go shoot, and then when I come back, let the pieces fall with it. Man, I'm back to salami sandwiches at night. But for right now, I got to watch this because you got to look good on camera. You don't want to look fucking bloated. I mean, the second day I was there, there was a point in the hotel room that I pissed every 15 minutes for three hours. Why? Like from those three flights after uh, I got there from Newark, that Monday I didn't do shit. And I went out, I did a bunch of little errands around New York, I had to mail some stuff and do shit. That fucking Monday, I was in my hotel room from three to seven, and from three to five, I pissed every 15 minutes, and it was three to four minute pisses. My body had retained so much fucking water from the flights even my water pills didn't you know but what i did was that monday when i got back i didn't do much but i lifted i went up to inform fitness and i lifted and that forced all that fucking fluid i had out of me which felt and when i got the easter sunday i ate chinese food so to top off the fucking the three plane rides and me retaining water i had the fucking chinese food and that really put me over the fucking top so monday my old fucking cuban ass i was just pissing I was ready to call the fucking 911 to come get me because I thought I was just going to dehydrate there on the spot. I wasn't even thirsty. It was just my body was holding so much fucking fluid in it that it was uh, it was fucking life-changing. You know what I'm saying? It's funny. I got a call when I was in New York the other day from a friend of mine. You look at opportunities, you know. Here I am shooting the Soprano movie. Let me tell you guys a little story. I got here in 97. And I was doing okay, you know, getting spots. I mean, I wasn't lighting the world on fire. I was hustling. I was doing the Mexicans rooms with Felipe, Willie Barcena, Gabriel, all those guys. And I was starting to pick up momentum right after 9-11, right before 9-11. I got a call one day from Rich Williams. He's a writer. We were with the same manager. And he goes, I got a new gig. Uh, it's working for the Best Damn Sports Show. And they want to do sketches. And I want to bring you in so you could do regular sketches. So he brought me the first time. They liked me. So they called me up and they gave me a shooting schedule. I thought I was going to light the world on fire. I was making $150 a show. Nice. Nothing. That's nothing. I thought I was going to get like 2000 Oh. When I got the call, I'm like, that's got to be 2000 It's Fox Sports and shit. They're going to give me some of that Frank Caliendo money. They gave me the guts. <laughs> Frank was already established on Fox Sports. I get to the fucking thing. Brody Stevens, God rest his soul, is on, is the warm-up. Rich is there, you know, a couple of So I got into the rotation. I must have done over 50 fucking sketches. From, just to let you know, guys, how life is, you know. I must have done 50 sketches for these guys. And all of a sudden, this comic from Boston moved to town. Very Italianist comic. He came from Boston with a bad reputation. I never judged him. I didn't really care. I had a mission to go on, and he hit the town like a fucking animal. I can't even describe it to you guys. 
He hit the town like something I never saw before. I thought I was finished. I'm like, whatever little heat I had going on, this kid has taken away my fucking heat. Not only was he getting spots at the store, Jamie Masada was giving him spots, the improv was giving him spots. He was the hot kid in town. And this went on for about a year and a half. It went on so long that one day, guess who hired him? The best damn sports show. And I went to Fox and pitched him an idea. And like a month later, this guy was doing my idea on Fox. Now, if you know anything about me, I could have gone up to the guy and said something. I didn't talk to the producers I pitched ever again. They kept calling me with some bullshit story. I never picked up the phone for them again. And eventually I, I just stopped working there. This guy had taken my uh, thunder from me. I never said nothing to the guy. I knew the guy had personal problems. I had hurt things. I wasn't jealous. I wasn't angry. I just knew something. You ever know something? Like, you, you just know. I didn't wish nothing bad on the guy or anything. I just knew something. I knew that I would outlast him. I knew that if I kept my P's and my Q's, that I would outlast him. And... He got a television deal. <clears throat> he was around town bragging. And by the time I got the law, then I started picking up a little momentum after the Sopranos, blah, 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 blah. And he moved away. Something happened in L.A. The TV show didn't go. And now I heard he was in Vegas. And every time I would hear about him, it's how good he was doing in Vegas. He was the king of Vegas. He had seven nights a week going at this casino and people were showing up. He was making all types of money. Was I jealous at all? No, I was doing my own thing by that time. But something didn't seem right, you know? I kept plugging along and didn't think of anything about it. I started getting, you know, my name is Earl and there was a strike and my stand-up evolved. And then I thought about quitting stand-up. He was still doing great, you know, in Vegas. I saw him at a UFC event. He walked up to me with that egotistical fucking smile that he had. But meanwhile, he had done a bunch of little bad things here and there, which again, I did worse things, but I did them in my youth. I wasn't doing them as a comic. And I don't know, maybe five years ago, a friend of mine calls and he goes, did you look on Facebook? What's going on in, in, in Vegas with this kid? And I went on Facebook and I found the article and it was just overwhelming. The poor kid had, had a, a bad, bad, bad gambling problem. He had just a bad gambling problem that followed him from Boston to L.A. and to Vegas now. You know, I mean, it's like me moving to Miami when I had my coke problem. You're just going there to die. You know, you're just going there to fucking die. It's a bad decision. This guy decided to move to Vegas. And, yeah, even though he was making money, he was borrowing money. But I mean, borrowing money from people like Lee, give me thirty thousand. Oh my God! And people were giving him thirty thousand, ten thousand. Some old lady gave him sixty thousand. You know, he was hey, he had the gift of gab. You can't blame it on the guy. If you're gonna go for money, go for it. If you ask ten people for fifty thousand dollars, two of them are gonna give them to you. You know, that's the law. I guess eventually. That's fucking scary. You know, if you go up to your friend with a good story, they'll give it to you. And he took all their money. He had a tax lien on him. And then all these people went to the newspaper and wrote this fucking, they wrote this big article in the Vegas newspaper about this kid. And I felt bad for the kid. I felt bad for the kid because once I got into comedy, the only vice I brought with me was cocaine. And I kept it to a minimum. I still didn't interfere. It did not interfere with my comedy. I did my comedy first, and I took care of my drug business later. It wasn't like they were going back and forth. Yeah, I sold coke to people from time to time at the club, and I put eight balls together, but it didn't affect me from doing my fucking job. It did, but it didn't. I was a functioning addict, okay? Let's, let's leave it at that. So they put the article in the paper about this guy and blah, 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 blah. Guess what? They keep giving him jobs. He keep, you know, it was smaller gambling venues, kept giving them jobs. And when I was in New York, I got a call from a dear friend of mine from Boston. And he goes, I just wanted to tell you something. I did a gig last week, and guess who's back in town? And I go, I don't know. 
And he told me this kid, and I'm like, no. Did they chase him out of Vegas? And he goes, yeah. And he's here in town saying that he's going to open up Eleven Comedy Club, but he's already bounced a bunch of checks. Oh. And, you know, guys, I felt like I wasn't, by no means am I happy by somebody else's, no means. I'm at an age now where I don't, it doesn't even bother me. I feel bad. I feel bad for Jesse Smollett. I feel bad for a lot of people. We, yeah, we fuck around and crack jokes, but I kind of feel bad for him that at this age, which is my age, he's still pulling that same thing. And I got to tell you something, guys. Between me and you, he was a great comic. He was a phenomenal improviser, and he could have turned out to be 20 times the comic that I am, Theo Vaughn is, you know, Tripoli. This guy could have been fucking huge today. But because he didn't take care of that problem, you know, he he let his character ruin his fucking destiny. You know what? I had a bad fucking drug problem all the time until I was 44 years old. And something hit me like a bolt of lightning one day. And before the grace of God, here we fucking are. And I haven't done a fucking line in 12 fucking years. And I'm very thankful. Yeah, I do my fucking edibles. I'm back on the edibles, by the way. I ate an edible <laughs> before I got on the jet blue flight, right? And I had to switch flights. You know me. I'm an asshole. I, I was done. And I switched flights. I took a later flight. I had my own little box. And, uh, whatever. Mint. Mint. And I could take the fucking edible. As I get to the airport, I take a water from mint, and right on the TSA line, I pop one of those 100 milligrams that's killing motherfuckers. As I walk through, I can feel my heart beating. You know what? <laughs> I need a Xanax to calm this tiger. And my buddy uh, gave me two of them when I saw him in New York, so I had one in my pocket, and I broke it in half and inhaled half of it. I saved the other half when I got off the plane so I could get home and go to sleep. I get on the plane. You know me. I put on my fucking ear iPod. And I start off with fucking super unknown. And the plane was delayed. But they took off from the gate in time. It just kept, you know, uh, driving. And it drove around for like 20 minutes. And the fuck, I thought we were in Kansas. We <laughs> drove for so long. I'm fucking stoned to the gills. And all of a sudden, like the fucking half hour mark, the, the pilot says that, listen, there's a lot of weather problems in the Midwest. We don't know if we'll be able to take off tonight. Don't let us know they're going to pull over to the side of the road. There was a bunch of planes on the side going by us. They had been okay because they were flying south. Planes that were flying west were all on, on hold because of the bad weather in the Midwest. It was tornadoes or some shit. Now I'm starting to think maybe I should have stayed on my plane. Maybe <laughs> this fucking plane's going to go down. So oh, now geez. I start panicking. The THC takes me to a place. <laughs> I'm thinking this plane's going to go down. I'm thinking about my funeral. You're writing your will? I'm thinking about my cemetery. I'm thinking about everything. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm never going to see my family, my friends, my daughter again. This plane's going to go down. And I'm like, what do I do? I go, hopefully they'll cancel this flight, and I'll get back on my original flight and fuck it. Fuck no. About 20 minutes later, the pilot comes on. He goes, we're leaving. Now my little fat heart is beating up a storm. I start farting the whole fucking day. <laughs> The blame takes off. And on, on JetBlue, you've got movies, TV, and direct TV. So I'm thinking, I'm doing the sign of the cross. I'm, play, I'm praying to every God that exists. I fucking press the button for direct TV. And I see CNN headlines. And I press that. Oh, no. And the first article that comes up is plane goes down in Florida. Friday night, a plane went down from Guantanamo, from Cuba. And right away, I was happy. I go, what are the chances of two planes going down on one night? You know what I'm saying? Fuck it. I'm good. <laughs> and after that, the fucking high went away, and I was fine to go. That's not where I, I would have gone. Oh, God. Oh, my God. I was petrified. That THC trip took me to a dark place. Thank God. And you started farting when you get nervous? Yeah, I started farting. <laughs> I fart when I'm nervous or not. I just start <laughs> farting. So it's just really weird that this kid had all the potential to be in this movie that I'm in and 20 other fucking things. But he let his gambling get in his way. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I went to see Shin Yun with my daughter. The Saturday before we left, she likes all that Chinese stuff. And she wanted to go see, see Shin Yun. I don't know if I told you guys the story. And I'm sitting there next to, in between my daughter and my wife. There's seats everywhere. And I'm looking towards my left. And all of a sudden, something hits the chair next to me like a fucking meteor. Like, ba-boom. 
And I turn around, and it's this lady, and I got no reason to lie to you. She was about 400 fucking pounds. She did not fit in that fucking chair. She was fuck. That was fat coming out of everywhere. Now, again, I didn't judge her. I felt bad for her. She was there with her mother, and there was a seat next to my wife, and she kept trying to hint if I could move to that seat so she could put her mother there. And I go, listen, I'm going to sit in my fucking chair. You know, I'm not fucking moving for your mom. She was a real pain in the ass, this woman. But eventually my wife said, do you want me to sit there? And I'll sit at the other, I'll switch with you. So I went and switched. She was a few years younger than me. She was about 400 pounds. She had a cane. And she was there with her mom. And she was talking to my wife. And I was listening to the conversation about her being on disability because of her weight. That she's tried every diet, blah, 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 blah. That she was a school teacher, but her knees, well, that would bother her so much. And she had to use a cane and the whole thing. And here she is, a 50-something-year-old woman. She's single. She's at this play with her mom that her mom had to buy her the ticket for, for her to come there. She's living just to survive on this disability check where she could be a teacher. And it really hit me a weird way because it hit me to the fact that here's this lady that could have had a life if she just lost a little bit of weight. Like if she just tried to lose a little bit of weight, she would have had a fucking life. She would have had a husband. She would have had kids. She wouldn't have had to be at a fucking play on a Sunday with a mom. Not that there's nothing wrong with that. But do you guys understand what I'm going for? She let this one thing get in her way and take her down. Like, she's already done with her life. She's 50-something years old, unless she goes, like, on a fucking huge, huge diet. She's never going to have the life that a normal girl... It, it wasn't that she was a bad-looking girl or anything. If this girl would have dropped 200 pounds when she was 28 and focused on it, she still would have been teaching. She wouldn't have had a fucking ceiling income on her of disability. And she would have had what's called a fucking life which is the reason why we do what the fuck we do every day. For years, I struggled with a fucking addiction that held me back and held me back. Thank God that I watched the movie Ray and somewhere along the line, it said that he had struggled with heroin until he was 60 years old. And, I, and I'm going, if I have to do this till I'm 60, I'm just not, it's gonna be a waste of my fucking life. You know, I woke up one day, I was 418 pounds. And I said, I got to do something about it. I walked into a Weight Watchers, and I'm so happy I did because I avoided the diabetes. I avoided all the pains and aches that go with it. I'm still a fat fuck. I'm still 60 pounds overweight. But it's a lot better than being 200 pounds overweight or 300 pounds overweight. This poor lady let her weight ruin her fucking life. Whether it's weight, an opiate problem, you know. Gambling. Gambling, fucking insecurities. You're letting these things hold you back from having a fucking life. What a shitty way to fucking go. You're going to be sitting there in a fucking bed a week away from dying, thinking about all the things you wanted to do, but you didn't because you let something hold you fucking down. I couldn't imagine being that comic in Boston today and still playing the games I was playing in 1995 and 1998 and 2003, where I was always in the hustle and always in the chase and, and lying to get a 20 and a 40 and a 60 and lying to my wife by just doing cocaine. It was such a fucking relief. I don't care what you got going on with your life. If you got something in your life that's stopping you from making your life be that much a little better, attack it. Attack it. Listen, I'm not saying you're going to win completely, but I'd rather drink two shots of vodka than 10 bottles of vodka a week. I'd much rather eat two Oreos than a whole bag of Oreos in two fucking nights. I'd much rather, you know, for a year, I fucking didn't do edibles. I did them like two or three times. You saw me eat here for five years, eat an enormous amount of edibles. And one day I said, something isn't right. It's holding us back. It's holding me back. And there you go. There you fucking go. In a year, we've made so much fucking progress. And yeah, I ate some edibles when I was back in New York to help me sleep because of the time change. I brought edibles with me. It's fine. They're not consuming who the fuck I am. I didn't eat an edible yesterday. 
I'm not, I'm not thinking about eating one today. And I got a few of them left at the fucking house. But it's these little things. If they're not going to let you get to who the fuck you are, think about that. Whether it's opiate, whether it's pills. I mean, uh, there's a church listener. Today is the memorial for a son, Crystal, in Austin, who used to date Bobby Sharon with the Cobra Cast podcast. My heart goes out to her. 28 years old, the son. They found him dead 10 years ago, 10 days ago. It's been bothering me. I called her last week and I, you know, I, I hit her up on, on fucking, uh, I had a message because her and I do, were messaging because of t-shirts. You know, when I went away, I didn't take Facebook with me and the only Twitter I had was on my fucking phone. I didn't have no social media in the hotel at all. I didn't want it. I wanted to take a fucking break from it. Uh, Bobby called me and said, and I thought about it, 28 years old, that could have been me when I kidnapped Bella. A bullet could have gone off and hit me in the leg and it would have cut an artery or something. I could have bled out. All the things that could have happened. It's not what I'm dwelling on today. What I'm talking about is if you have something that isn't letting you be where you strive to be, just work on it a little bit. I'm not telling you to quit. I know how hard it is to get clean. Don't I fucking know it. It took me 27 fucking years. It's not going to take you overnight either. Thank God my fat little heart didn't give up along the way. There was a time when my wife was fucking tying my shoelaces. There was a time that if the elevator was broken, I would not go upstairs. It was three flights of fucking stairs. Now, listen, I'm not flying upstairs and I'm not running stairs at the L.A. auditorium, but at least I'm not huffing and fucking puffing no more. You know, if something's in your way, it's an obstacle of you becoming who you need to become, Fucking get it out of your way. At least push it a little bit, just to the side, just for now. Just so you can go around it, so you don't become a fucking slave to it like I did for years. I'm not here to tell you how to live your life. I'm just telling you what I see through my fucking eyes. Like, I'm just... When I was packing to leave, I thought about the show, The Sopranos. And I thought about how that fucking guy went to the producers and told them that I told somebody... And all of a sudden, my mind switched. I was like, how happy am I that he went to the producers? Because at the end of the day, I wasn't ready. I would have made a fool out of myself. Even though I was here 10 years, I had been already involved in acting, maybe three or four. I'd done a few movies. I was not ready for what David Chase and high-level people had to offer. I just wasn't ready. Th today, I thank Steve Sharippa with all my heart for going to The Sopranos behind my back because I got to work. I got to the original fucking goal anyway. And now, guess what? Now I'm ready for it. Now I, I absorbed it like a fucking sponge, and I went in there. And when you guys watch the movie, you're going to go, you know what? We're fucking proud. I'm going to make you proud that you put your money on me, that you bet on me, that every week, even though I say the most fucking rudest things, <laughs> you believed in me. You know, you come watch me. You buy the T-shirts. We're a fucking family. A win for me is a win for you. You're a part of this. Not because you're a fucking fan of mine, but because you believe. You send me messages. You send me stuff in the mail. We've created something fucking great. When I, was, when I would go home at night after I would shoot this movie, yeah, I would think about my daughter and my wife. But I thought a lot about you guys and what you were going to think about it. And how you've been listening for six years. And you've seen a change in yourself. And you've seen a change in me. This is what I... I'm here to do a podcast that I stand behind 150% every week. What I talk about on this podcast, I strictly believe, you know, I went home and I saw one of my buddies and we were talking about sushi and I go, where do you go for sushi? He goes, I used to go to that place but I found out they were Koreans, fuck them. That's our mentality. <laughs> That's where I came from. I was happy that there's still people who <laughs> think like me. I'm not a fucking Martian. I came from a place where there was class, there was a little respect. North Bergen is a fucking hole. You know, but it's my hole. It's what created me. That New York City, I saw two fucking rats when I was there. I saw a rat the first day, and I saw a rat Thursday night. I saw a rat Thursday night that looked like a fucking cat in Brooklyn. <laughs> Not only was he big, he stopped and he looked at the vehicle like, go ahead, I dare you to hit me. Your fucking car will dent. This thing looked like a fucking, like a little, I saw a skunk too in North Bergen. Uh, Saturday night, I went out with one of my childhood fucking friends. I mean, 
childhood, childhood, childhood friends. I was supposed to do a thousand things, and he called me out of the blue, and he goes, hey, man, I have time tonight to go out to dinner with you. He's an assemblyman now, and I said, I'll go out to dinner with you on one condition, that we don't talk politics, and there's no fucking politicals around to fucking bring me down. And he goes, done. So he went to this restaurant in Jersey City called Alexander's Steakhouse. On the way back, we went fucking, we took the scenic route. He showed me all the accomplishments he had done in North Bergen. I'm very proud of him. You know, he took over Hudson County Park. He took over, but he showed me what the plans were for North Bergen in the future, you know. And we went to my mother's neighborhood. We went to, we looked at the school, all this. On Saturday night, while more people were jumping up and down, we went and had a nice fucking dinner. And on the way back, we just drove. We just drove 20 miles an hour. We drove. He showed me where two guys were, the route I used to walk. We drove by all my friends' houses to see how their houses looked, all the construction that's happened in the last 30 years. And I got to see him. I got to see George. I got to go out with a friend named Tizzy. I got to see Timmy Holloway at the New York Comedy Club. I got to see some comics I haven't seen in a while, Sarah Talamash, who might be on the show next week, and Bob Biggestaff. It really was. I'm happy that Tom Popper and everybody else talked me out of my fucking fears. If you get an opportunity, man, and it feels right, but your fear takes over, just do it for yourself. Take a fucking chance. Who gives a fuck anymore? Without taking chances, nothing's going to happen for you in this life. Nothing. I took the biggest chance of my life. You know, I, I can't get into the particulars about the movie and whatnot. But listen, man, uh, take the fucking chance. Don't do what I did for years and a thousand other people who were scared of making forward progress. Fucking go for it. Who gives a shit if you fail? You're going to fail 80 times. The thing is, the more you go, the less the failures. Every year you get less failures. In 82, you're going to have 21 failures. Your Jeep's going to blow up. That's all part of life. What you're trying to do is keep the failure rate down throughout the years. So there's no fuck-ups. And pretty soon, you're running fucking smooth. Because you've already overtaken all these fucking failures that come in your life. Things are going to happen. Things happened when I was in New York. I didn't make a big deal about it. I had a migraine headache for four days. Nobody had a Vicodin. You know, shit like that. But you just push forward. I'm very happy I accepted that role. I'm very happy I went to New York. And I'm very happy that I get to fucking make you guys proud of me. And with that, let me give you some dates I'm going to do. Right now, all I'm fucking pushing is June 6th. I you know June 7th at the Harris in uh, New Orleans and June 8th I'm at the Tabernacle motherfucking theater in Atlanta fucking Georgia. How's that for you motherfuckers? Then I got yeah June 28th and 29th I'm in Columbus four shows in and out no fucking drama and the full schedule will be out mid-May of what's left for the rest of the year. I'm not going to do much just a couple weeks here and there just to keep fucking loose and whatever. Thank you very much for letting me ramble today about my experience. The whole time I was there, I thought about you guys, and I thought about how I almost fucking turned down the project to be a little fucking pussy, and I thought about how bad I would feel for you guys if I would have turned it down because of my fucking fears. Never be scared of nothing, and never be scared of moving forward. Now for a word from our sponsors. I want to talk to you people about something that's very important to me, and that's CBD oil. You want to find a reliable CBD company, but they're all over the fucking place. Everybody's got a CBD oil. You don't know what you're buying. It's like the ginseng explosion of the 80s. You're probably buying fucking dick. With CBD line, you know what the fuck you're buying. Why? Because before you even spend a dollar, you're going to go on their website, cbdline.com, and look at their test results, their third-party test lab results yourself. They're the real deal. I've been involved with them for about fucking three months now. And I love them. I reached out to them. That's how fucking good I like the product. The product. You understand me? So picking a reliable company is like pulling teeth. But that day's over. Because Uncle Joey is here to the motherfucking rescue. Looking for you cocksuckers? I found CBD Lion. And now you find CBD Lions. They make CBD Lion products from start to finish. And they got you covered with the tincture, the vapor, the shatter, the fucking uh, the, the pens. I mean, they got vapor pens. And if you look at all the causes that... The symptoms that it takes care of, your, your fucking jaw drop. The gummies are good. The, the gummies are good. This is the way to go for your CBD products. CBD line. It comes in vapor cartridges, shatter, you know, eat a gummy. I mean, you can put it under your tongue. 
Their products are clean, Bobby. And they aren't like the fakes that uh, with the false fucking advertising. CBD Lion is the way to go. You check out their third-party test results for yourself. Now, the church family gets 20% off. 20%, not 10, not 15, not 5. 20% off at checkout by using code name church. That's cbdlion.com. The best in the business. And they got something that you can rub on your shoulders. You can rub it on your nutsack. I don't give a fuck what you do. <laughs> CBD Lion is there for you. Again, go to cbdlion.com. Do not forget May 12th is Mother's Day. Don't be a schmuck. Without your mother, you'd be nothing. You understand me? Do not forget. Where would you be without your mom? Nowhere. You'd be in a toilet somewhere. That's where you'd be. Pro, Pro Flowers is here to help you show your appreciation this year. My wife, Terry, she's getting two dozen of these. You understand me? Beautiful red roses. They come in a beautiful package. You have your card in there, whatever the hell you want to do. Beautiful Pro Flowers let you choose from a variety of bouquets and vases that suit every mom's style. All you got to do is pick the delivery date, whether you want to get them there a day earlier or on Mother's Day. Then, then Pro Flowers carefully packages your flowers and delivers them fresh from the farm, smelling tremendous. Your wife opens up that box, your mom, your sister, whatever mom you have in your life, Pro Flowers is the way to go. Express delivery means her flowers stay fresh, and that's what you're looking for. You understand me? So right now, you get a dozen assorted roses. Are you ready for this? $19.99. I dare you to find it cheaper. $19.99. If you find it cheaper, those roses will be dead in three hours. As soon as she gets them, they'll just go like olive oil. You don't want that. You want nice roses, beautiful roses. And if you double the roses, you get a premium vase for just $9.99 more. Who are you gonna, where are you going to get those prices at? Uncle Joey always saves the day, even Mother's Day. You understand me? So visit proflowers.com right now. You click the microphone on the upper right-hand corner, and you enter the promo code HAPPENING, H-A-P-P-E-N-I-N-G. That's proflowers.com. Click the microphone and use the code HAPPENING. Proflowers is here to help you. This is going to make it nice and easy for you, whether you like your mother or not. Like I told you in the beginning, if you like it, you send the flowers, and you show up with more flowers or candy. If you don't like it, send the flowers. You need to show up, but at least you don't have to feel guilty about yourself. Mother's Day is May 12th. It's May 5th. I'm giving you seven days to work it out, or May 6th tomorrow. I'm giving you whatever it is, eight, nine, I don't know. What am, what am I, a mathematician? Just go to proflowers.com right now. Click the microphone in the upper right-hand corner. And then the promo code church. Order like a pro and get this amazing rose deal to thank all the moms in your life. So I want to thank CBD Lion. I want to thank Pro Flowers. But most importantly, I want to thank you savages for always listening. It's Monday, motherfuckers. Grab your balls and let's look forward. It's a whole new motherfucking horizon and you guys are part of it. Like I said, June 7th, the Fillmore. At New Orleans, it's your type of place, Harris. And June 8th, I'm at the Tabernacle. You're going to fucking love it. You understand me? And then Columbus on the 28th and 29th. I want to thank you. I want to thank your families. I want to thank all you motherfuckers for supporting the church. I want to thank the Christ Killer for always being here. And that's it and that's that. I'll see you Thursday morning, nice and fucking early, tip-top Magoo. Have a great week. Uncle Joey loves you. Kick this fucking mule, Lee.